Hello and welcome to the GLHF YouTube channel. I am Dave Breens, and once again I'm here with Kirk and Keend. All right. And this time, a very special guest, Alex Arnoldson. Hello. How I don't know doing? why I'm waving. We're audio, aren't we? Only aren't we? Yeah, it's yeah, me we, waving we, away. It's, it's for just me. The audio. It's for me. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it feel more personal, right? Well, everyone listening can know that I am waving. That's at important. At me specifically. Well, well. You know, at the audience, I think. <laughs> all right, all right. We're talking about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, we're we're going to spoil the whole thing. We're going to talk about the ending. We're going to really, really go in. So this is the spoiler warning. If you don't want to be told about everything that's going to happen and have that broken down, uh, click off now. For everyone else, uh, Alex, is it a good game? Yeah, it's a good game. Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like in our little, you know, we were obviously chatting around release and when, in the run-up to the review embargo and things like that. And I think you were saying before you came on, right, that you, you feel like between among us there was sort of a a spectrum of views and I was on the lowest end. Um, but my lowest end is still that it's a good old 8 out of 10, high 8 as well. Um, I just didn't feel, for me, uh, that it was... I'm quite shocked that it is within three points of like Baldur's Gate and uh, and Elden Ring on Metacritic. That seems slightly insane to me, given some of the stuff that the game struggles with. But it's really, really good, and 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 I do think it's probably on balance the best Final Fantasy game uh, since the PS2 era. At least yeah. the best numbered one. There's definitely some very good spin-offs in there. Like I'm one of those people who will forever say that. Um, Crystal Chronicles, my life is a, as a king, is one of the greatest games of of the Wii generation. Full stop. But um, but yeah, it's still incredibly, incredibly good, and so ambitious and so impressive. So yeah, it is a good game, and I. It's a funny one. I recommend it to everyone, but at the same time, it depends on what you want out of it because there's many things where if you're coming at this from the perspective of you haven't played remake. Uh, I find it harder to recommend without first playing There's no playing point that. in playing it. If and actually, I think, remake. I mean, I know you're going to disagree because you, you are you are this person, <laughs> but I think if you haven't played the original game in Crisis Core, you'll get a lot less out of it as well. Um, but Dave got more out of it than us. That's so fucked up. The, yeah, no, what's, sense, what's even worse than that is that I finished Crisis Core and not the original. What the hell, Dave? <laughs> Why <laughs> do you like this? Yeah, that yeah. helps because I actually think the Crisis Core knowledge. If you played Crisis Core and and re and remake, I think you have enough knowledge. Mm -hmm. You miss out on some of the nudge nudge wink wink. But actually, what's funny about the nudge nudge wink wink is some of that we miss out on as Westerners anyway. Mm -hmm. Where I've been mm -hmm. doing the extremely sad thing of like looking at uh, with some other people working on transcribing the Japanese script and transcribing the Western script and then translating the West the Japanese script to see you know how well, dig, different it is digging into that, alex they changed the line in remake right at the end of the game when Aerith walks out of uh, midgar for the first time yeah and that was to get across a double meaning if you want to well, explain so, that mm, it wasn't it wasn't so so i spoke to someone at square about that and what i was told by a friend was basically that the original translation um the creative people tatsuya namura and kazushige nojima and people like that looked at that translation and felt like uh, even though it was a lovely flowery translation and it sort of was a lovely, lovely line. And mm -hmm. I actually think the English line was better than the Japanese original, but they wanted a more literal translation. If that's for reasons related to some of the stuff that happens in Rebirth, I don't know. Cause that doesn't really come up again. Um, it does make sense it. though. Cause obviously you get, you get that scar in the sky and she says, it does, but like she the can't, sky, she know? can't see it seemingly. So yeah, but, Why she said, but you, yeah. you say that, but she's fucking. She's talking to herself, like another version of herself, all the way through the game, right? So she obviously knows more than she's letting on. Uh, is she that? Well, I mean, I think she knows more than she's letting on, but I think some people have got confused by this because you. There's a couple of times earlier on in the game when you have Aerith talking and you hear her from behind a door, yeah. and then you walk in. But what that's supposed to be is foreshadowing the red reveal. She's always talking to Red, and Red is talking in his in his child voice. Right. Okay. So in, in um, Costa del Sol in, in Johnny's uh, hotel place, there's obviously a, sh a scene where she's in the shower and she's talking about the white material losing its power. 
Mm-hmm. And I thought initially that, yeah, that was her convening with someone else. What I actually realized on rewatching it is, oh, she's just talking to Red, but Red's talking oh. in the voice and the subtitles have question mark, question mark, question mark over Red's lines. Because you're meant to be thinking, who's that she's talking to? But obviously the reveal once you hit Cosmo is, oh, she was just talking to Red. Who See, that didn't that didn't click for me, but that makes sense. I really liked Red's uh, voice change, though. I thought it added a lot to his characterization. I... It's a bit much for me. Um, <laughs> I feel like the problem is, and this is actually one of the problems in adapting a game like this, is in the original script of Final Fantasy VII, what happens is Red doesn't have a voice, so his voice can't mm. change, I guess. But his voice changes in the sense of, in the Japanese, all the honorifics and stuff he uses changes to all the honorifics that children would use. And right. so that's how they sort of get that across. And I think, so you end up having that question of how do we get that across? And the answer becomes, we're going to give him, you know, uh, uh, an anime teenager voice once he hits a certain <laughs> point. I'm just not massive on it. I respect things like, I don't know if you guys noticed this. I didn't notice this, but one of the other guys on RPG site noticed this. If you skip side quests in earlier chapters and then go back to do them after that reveal, they re-record all his dialogue again what with the, the second voice, which is really nice. Um but yeah, it's one of the, it's the same as Kate Sif, right? Like where Kate Sif speaks in a very specific regional Japanese dialect. Yeah, and, and he sometimes original, slips into it into his proper voice. Yeah, and in the, the original game, the person yeah. who is behind Kate Sif sometimes accidentally almost reveals who they are by slipping into that voice. And although I really do like the Scots accent that Kate Sif's got, and it's great that they got an actual native Scot to do it, um, it feels like quite a heavy handed way of getting that across. But yeah, yeah I mean, I'm just imagining the Turks sat in his office putting that accent on now. And it's well, that out. should happen in game three. He's not a Turk, though. He's not a Turk? No, he's just... Well, uh, I'm a fake He's fan. on the board, I guess you'd say. I'm a fake We're now fan. getting into spoilers for the next game and Dave's looking like... No, it's, no, no. It's fine. We're going to dig into that anyway. But before we go into that, I, w- I wanted to ask you, Alex, because... Uh, even as a diehard Final Fantasy VII fan, I'm very confused by how many Sephiroths there are in all of the games. Like, so, and firstly, what is the plural of Sephiroth? Well, I suppose it's Sephiroths, isn't it? But <laughs> Sephiroth? Yeah, like, that sounds yeah. angelic, doesn't it? You know? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe that's... Hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of like that. Yeah, because what what are angels called? They're called seraphim. Seraphim. Seraphim, exactly. Which I, I don't know Seraphi, if that's actually related. Sephiroth. I yeah. don't know if that's. Anyway, but yeah. How many Sephiroths, Alex? Well, I mean, you'd be amazed <laughs> how like we've obviously got a, a, a specific Slack channel for Five Hundred Seven Rebirth in the the RPG site staff channels, and a lot of time. Uh, obviously spent on thinking about guides and content, but a lot of time is just spent on this particular game has just been spent puzzling out this stuff. So, okay. In remake, there are four. So in remake, there is the one that's in cloud's head, which is just part of his trauma that Mm. he sees that taunts him. Uh, There is God, I'm, I'm struggling to, to remember now there's one, there's one in cloud's head. There's the one that is whenever there's a black robe, so the the guys in black robes can manifest as Sephiroth to certain people. Because um, they're like clones, right? Yeah. So all through the fin- the original Final Fantasy VII, you don't see real Sephiroth for until the, 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 the final third of the game, really. Um, and that's an alternate dimension Sephiroth, right? Well, no, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> just just rewind back to Final Fantasy VII. So there's, the, so there's four Sephiroths in Remake. And the first three are in the original Final Fantasy VII, and that's important to understand. So the first one is just a guy in Cloud's head that he sees in visions that taunts mm. him. The second is in flashback. So when you see the Nibelheim sequence, obviously yeah. that's a Sephiroth, but it's not a, cont- a, a, a current Sephiroth. And then there's the black robes, which is any person who is a black robe, and there are hundreds of black robes canonically in the universe, can sort of, through you know, nonsense, Mag- through Genova bullshit. magic nonsense, <laughs> can manifest a Sephiroth. And in the original Final Fantasy VII, for most of the game, the Sephiroths you it's see... It's just in a crater, isn't he? Well, so for most of the original one. Final Fantasy VII, every Sephiroth you see is just a black robe. So, like, the one who kills the president in Shinra Tower, black robe. The one who uh, kills the, the, the Midgar Zolom, yeah. black robe. And so on and so forth. 
And then it's only when you get to the Northern Crater and the real Sephiroth has no legs because the in the aftermath of Nibelheim, he just loses the bottom half of his body. Um, so, yeah, so there's those three. And that is largely the same in Remake. And we'll get on to Rebirth. And then at the end of Remake, <laughs> so all through Remake, those three appear in various times. And so you can identify pretty easily in each scene which it is. So like uh, the, the when Cloud is going back to Sector A, Sector Five, and he sees the sort of a Sephiroth that taunts about the coming death of Aerith, that's mm-hmm. obviously the one in his head. Whereas when he goes to the apartments at Tifa's place and that's he sees a, a guy and almost kills him with his sword, that's a black row. Mm-hmm. Um, but then at the very end of remake, you get to the end of the highway and there's a Sephiroth there. And that Sephiroth is described by Square in their own materials as unknown. So it, it, that is a fourth Sephiroth, and it's not really clear who that is. Okay, so here, here's the now. Re- he's the re-birth. interdimensional Sephiroth, right? Yeah, he wants so, to change fate. Or... So my my read, and none of this is, de- is for definite, but my belief about that is that that is actually the Sephiroth from the original game slash Advent Children, who has been defeated multiple times, and, you know, his last line is Advent, in Advent Children is, I will never become a memory. <laughs> so he's saying, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to be back. And I think what he's basically done is, through various shenanigans through the live stream, managed to travel back in time and travel across universes. And is trying to manipulate events to create a version of events where he wins. So this is a Sephiroth who has complete knowledge of the events of the first game, complete knowledge of what happens to him, complete knowledge of Advent Children. And if you think about the end of Remake, um, the the final boss of Remake but one is three of those whispers, but they're like higher level whispers. And one of them uses their fists, one of them uses a gun, and one of them uses a sword. And when you scan them with the Assess Materia, um, it sort of it, it what it says is like powerful whispers that are trying to uh, protect the future that creates them. And what Square has said after the fact, um, they actually attached this. They'd had an interview that they attached to the recent cinema screenings of Advent Children, where the developers made some comments. And this is one of the things that they people like me had been saying this for years, but this is one of the things they confirmed. Those three guys are meant to be the three Sephiroth remnants that appear in Advent Children, Yazoo, Kadaj, and Loz. Right. So it's meant to be those three guys manifesting as those whispers, which is why they've got the same weapons and fighting styles, in order to protect the history that creates them. And the history that creates them is the original game leading into Advent Children, if that makes sense. So so basically, I think the the, the unknown Sephiroth is the Sephiroth that... Uh, that The original Sephiroth. The the original Sephiroth that has all sorts of knowledge and is basically trying to mess things up. So there's two original Sephiroths, but one's from the future, basically. Well, this is the interesting thing, because (laughs) I think this is the question for Game 3. It's like, there's a Sephiroth following you around, and what's clear now is the lines are beginning to blur. So there are still some that are clearly just black robes, and there are still some that are just in Cloud's head. But what's getting more blurry is more all, almost all the Sephiroths appear to now have this future knowledge. So I don't know if when they did what they did at the end of Remake, they sort of broke a boundary that allowed him to do that. But the impression that I get now is this future Sephiroth has taken over all the other versions of himself. The question for the third game is, is there still a legless one chilling in the Northern Crater? Um, someone I know has this theory that they, they strongly believe that what's going to happen is like the the unknown Sephiroth, the probable Advent Children Sephiroth, is going to kill that himself. version of himself. <laughs> uh, which I could totally see. That would be a cool scene. Um, but the key thing to understand is basically, never mind how many there are, <laughs> but there's a future one that is dabbling about and messing about and trying to change what's happened. Um and it's that one clearly that, at least in Rebirth, is in control of the Black Whispers. He's the one that, like, because we're in spoiler territory, so we'll just say it. He's the one that kills Aerith in this, right? The future one. Well, I mean, who knows? But the, <laughs> because the, if he is, like, he's not changing anything. Well, is he? This is he's where he's still becomes, taking all the steps to to go along the same path. You know, the, this is where it becomes interesting because the 
it's all interesting. But like in the original game, obviously the one that kills Aerith is a black robe. Mm-hmm. It's just a black robe that's manifested out as him. And as those black robes tend to do, they then leave behind a piece of Genova that morphs into um that morphs into a larger version of Genova that you then fight. And that's how it in fact in the original game, originally, which I think sheds a bit of light and it's like this isn't the canon now, but saying this almost helps with understanding. Originally there weren't lots of black robes. There was only one black robe that broke out of Shinra Tower and you were chasing the black that single black robe around the world. And the idea was that black robe underneath was like the pieces of Genova. And so that's mm-hmm. why whenever you defeat um one of the Genova bosses in the original game, something's left behind, like that was like oh, an arm. A little tentacle or something. And the idea was gonna be you would follow that there were originally more Genova fights as well. So the idea was you were gonna fight follow that black robe around and fight Genova like five times, every time a piece of body being left behind. And by the time that black robe got to the northern crater, it was literally just gonna be a heart floating underneath the robe. Um, right. They ditched that for this whole experimentation Hojo thing, but it's sort of that sort of gets the point across of what of what the black robes are. So, original in the original game, that's a black robe that manifests as a Sephiroth comes down and kills Aerith. Yes, however, a Sephiroth comes down and kills Aerith, and now this guy, this Sephiroth, is talking about his grand plan to harvest hatred and a confluence of worlds and the worlds merging. So this Sephiroth is clearly aware of all this multiverse stuff mm-hmm. that at remake wasn't introduced until literally half an hour before the end. Um, so who knows? Like, I guess the options are that that's still a black robe, but now the, the master Sephiroth is, is, is now influencing and controlling them all and puppeteering them all. Yeah. Or the master Sephiroth has literally just replaced them all. But so- Dave, how do you feel about this as someone who doesn't like know the original game? Because it must sound like Alex has got a whiteboard behind him and he's connecting little red strings. Uh, um, let me have a think. Okay, so I I I already like went into this like with the understanding that there were like several Sephiroths and like the 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 restarted timeline and like sephiroth lingering lingering in the live stream and seemingly being able to like reinfest the this, this current timeline with like the 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 his abilities from the past one um but it's fucking kind of hard to keep track of uh i remember watching the 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 end cut scene and uh trying to keep track of stamp the dog uh, and, and counting like at least four different variations. There's a lot. There's just a lot. There's just a lot to think about, and it's really, really hard to keep track of. Um, I still choose to believe that the Sephiroth that appeared in Smash Brothers is canon to this. That's that's my that's my opinion uh, <laughs> going forward. I don't care what Alex thinks. And one last question I have, which is uh, really burning for me: Who the fuck's Glenn? Oh no! So what I'll say is the Sephiroth in Smash. <laughs> Is the original Sephiroth because he has quite a different costume to the mm. one that appears in remake. Um, they're quite quite specific in uh, in Smash about their Sephiroth design is is the is the is the the uh, the original one the the, the PS one one I guess because the PS one version is the only version of Final Fantasy VII that's on Switch to be fair. Sure, um, but Glenn is a mysterious character from a mobile game basically glenn is a soldier first class that fought in the wutai war much the same as zach um, i think a little bit earlier down the timeline than zach though so that mobile game ever crisis ever crisis is basically like a mobile gacha version of the original final fantasy 7 that also uses a bunch of assets from remake and rebirth so it looks like OG Final, it looks like a modern version of OG Final Fantasy VII with the like super deformed chibi uh, characters on the field. And then when you go into battle, it's remake graphics um, because they literally use the character models and stuff and effects from remake. It's quite an, it's quite a uh, expedient way of making a game like that. But it's also the thing about Ever Crisis is it's supposed to be gathering together all the compilation stuff, so they'll even be a gamified version of the storyline of Advent Children. They'll do Dirge of Cerberus. They have already started doing Crisis Core. They'll do Before Crisis, which has never been officially released in the West, but that's a prequel uh, that stars the Turks, both ones we know and new ones. Um, 
and yeah, so they've also got this original narrative, uh, which features a young Sephiroth, and it also features this guy, Glenn. Um, the thing is, that storyline isn't finished. So what they've sort of done is they establish Glenn in that, and they then introduce Glenn, obviously, much further down the timeline in Rebirth. But we don't know about anything that happens in between those two points. So, like, Glenn at the end of the game appears to also be a black robe. Yeah, I was going to say, he's not actually turning Glenn, into Sephiroth. Well, so, but that is, I guess they're going to do that Kingdom Hearts thing of, like, even now, that bloody Kingdom Hearts Union Cross game. I'm not a Kingdom Hearts person, and when I, I say... I was hoping we'd get through this podcast without mentioning Kingdom Hearts. I think Hearts, it's impossible, given the nature of this. But when I say <laughs> that Kingdom Hearts is, is... When I say that it's getting like Kingdom Hearts, Kingdom Hearts fans, calm down. Kingdom Hearts fans don't interact. <laughs> It's not a pejorative. I'm not saying Kingdom Hearts is bad, but it's a very Kingdom Heartsy sort of way of telling this story. So yeah, they really are. It's going to be like uh, that Kingdom Hearts Union Cross game is still delivering story that's going to lead up to and into Kingdom Hearts 4. And so I think basically, if you want to really stay on top of the law, you'll want to stay on top of Ever Crisis for Some multimedia the thing, next few it? years, because I'm sure yeah. it'll be drip feeding Glenn and Wutai war law until the future. But the answer is really, you don't really know. He's a soldier. Some people feel like he looks enough like Cloud. He's blonde, that he could be Cloud's dad. Um, oh. Because Cloud's dad has always been a complete unknown. He was just some dude that came in, knocked his mum off and knocked his mum up and peaced out. So I feel like that would be a bit too twee, even for them. But, um, but yeah, so we don't really know. That's, Before that's we move on to stamp the dog because i know you've got a lot of uh you've done a lot of research and fair is there i feel like we should explain what genova is for those who don't know because we're just assuming a bit of knowledge there and we spoke about it I mean, evil alien. alien god thing evil yeah, it's, alien it's, it's an evil yeah. it, what genova is 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 uh it's a bit of an rpg trend at that time like uh, lavos from chrono trigger is basically the same it's it's something that fell out of the sky yeah, and it's, it's swapping out gods for aliens, isn't it? It's the same fucking thing, though, basically. A little bit, yeah. I mean, it, the, the whole Genova thing is Genova supposedly lands on a planet, sort of strips the planet, ruins the planet, and then somehow gets back off the planet and goes and lands on another one and continues the cycle. Just hitches um, a ride in Rocket Town. Yeah, yeah, I guess so, yeah. But, like... <laughs> That is, and there's there's more lore dropped in this game about Genova than there really ever has been before. You've got the, the sequence in the Temple of the Ancients with their holograms and stuff, like all that. Oh, is quite that that's new. leading on to the Gi stuff, isn't it? Which we're going to talk about later as well, because yeah, they expanded yeah. on that quite a lot. All right, let's go stamp. Tell us about stamp because you you've you. Uh, do you want to plug your thing on RPG sites? It's really worth a read the, anyway. There's a write up on RPG site where if you want, uh, if you want to read about the ending, it's a long, like almost four thousand word, real deep sort of write. This means this. This means this. With screenshots and annotations and all that sort of stuff. If you go to RPG site.net or you can go to at RPG site on Twitter slash X, and you'll find a link to it there. I'm sure. Um, but basically, the stamp is a dog. Is, is a fictional dog. Might not be fictional, to be fair. Might be based on a real dog, but um, within the universe of Final Fantasy VII. But basically, Stamp is the kid-friendly mascot of the Shinra military. And all through Final Fantasy VII Remake, you see Stamp a lot of times, and they make a point to point Stamp out a lot of the time. Like, there's a there's a really slightly crap dungeon where you're going through, um, like, train tunnels and stuff like that yeah, and the graffiti that. of stamp points you which direction to go you follow stamp's nose they say so they make a big point about making sure that you know stamp and you know what he looks like and stamp is a beagle with a little military hat with some stars on it and that sort of stuff when you get to the end of final fantasy 7 remake um obviously people who've played crisis core know that zach is supposed to die and you do some stuff that allegedly is going to break you free of fate and then the very next thing you see is cuts back to Zack's death scene as it happens in Crisis Core, except Zack survives. And one of the things they're very careful to do is they have like a potato chip packet fly past the camera and it even slows down a little yeah. bit as it goes past the camera. And these are the same potato chips you actually see the characters eating in Jesse's house in Chapter 4, except the stamp on the bag is different. It's a very subtle thing, but basically the stamp is meant to represent that 
this is a different universe because stamp is different has a different design and and so that is a terrier dog Mm -hmm. um of stamp where again he has different breed of dog and he's got slightly different military rather than a hard military hat he's got like a baseball style cap you know all that sort of stuff so that was how things were left in remake and then in rebirth we see a bunch more so just to very very quickly run down it all the main stuff with the main story and the main characters all takes place in uh in beagle still so it you will ever ever, ever so occasionally you'll find a bit of stamp graffiti out in the world that's all still the beagle so it's all still the same universe as remake but all the zack stuff all those zack interludes you cut to mm-hmm. so up to a certain point all of those take place in the terrier universe <laughs> And then you get to a point at which they make a big deal out of a cutscene, right? Where Zach is sitting on a motorbike, and if he goes left, he is making the decision to go after Biggs. And if he goes right, he's making the decision save to Cloud. go to Shinra Building to try to find a cure to save Cloud's life. And it makes a big deal. And Zach chooses in that scene to go right and go to the Shinra Building. And a few weird things happen. The first thing is. Um, you see sort of a wash of rainbow light come down the path that he didn't take, which I think is meant to represent that, you know, the universe has branched at that point, butterfly effect stuff. You then see Zack in the Shinra building on a motorbike, very similar to Cloud at the end of Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, and if you look very closely, you can see in the background, there's like a, a poster with stamp on it, and that's still the Terrier stamp. And in that universe... Zack goes off against a, a whole platoon of Shinra soldiers and it's not clear whether he lives or dies. It's just like, just left there. But obviously Zack, the whole thing is Zack goes down to a platoon of Shinra soldiers. So it's almost like the universe is trying to make the same thing happen to him. It's trying to kill him in the same way he was supposed to die. Yeah, because he's trying to save Cloud again. Right? Yeah, and and, the, and then, well, regardless of who, what, he, like, yeah. what he's trying to do, because then you've got, then it cuts and suddenly he's in the reactor with Biggs, which is the decision he didn't make in the scene that we saw. But suddenly we're seeing a version as if he'd turn left instead. Very Doctor Who all this. Literally, there is an episode of Doctor Who called Turn Left, which is about what happens if someone takes a left turn at a, at a traffic intersection instead of a right turn and all the ways that changes and ruins the universe. It's very similar to that. And... So we then see a scene with Zack and Biggs and Biggs is eating a packet of potato chips, stamp potato chips. This time they got a pug on the bag. So this is our indication that this is a different universe. It's not Terrier, it's not Beagle. So we'll call this the pug universe. It's only single scene in there, but in this scene, Zack goes to rescue Biggs. Biggs ends up getting shot and killed. Zack ends up being faced off with an entire platoon again. And in sort of a very, I thought it was quite funny in a lame sort of way, but in a sort of, way that deliberately mirrors uh, Crisis Core. While his theme plays from Crisis Core, Zack decides not to fight and die, but to run away. And so the last we see of this Zack is he's trying to run away. We don't know again if he lives or dies. Then it cuts again. (laughs) And this time, Zack apparently hasn't made a decision. He's sitting on the steps of the church and he's literally saying to himself, Cloud, Aerith or Biggs, how do I choose? And Johnny, the guy from the slums who appears in both games, walks past. This time it's not as obvious, but he's got a little plush toy under his arm. And it's a Shiba Inu dog. And that, again, has like a military bandana. So it's clearly a different stamp. So this is the Shiba Inu universe, I guess. And in this universe, this is where he Zach's sitting on the steps of the church and then Sephiroth just shows up and walks into the church quite ominously. And that's the future Sephiroth, isn't it? It, it appears, it appears this will, will come on to that. Cause I think that's like, <laughs> um, but basically, yeah, he Sephiroth sees Zach. Zach tries to start a fight on him. Basically he says, you want a piece of me? And <laughs> Sephiroth literally turns to him and says, no, not you. And with a slash of, with a slash of his sword, Zach literally falls through a hole in the world into a void, into a black void. And that's important. We'll come back to that. But at that point, he's left the Shiba Inu universe. <sighs> and then you have um, when Cloud, after the events, in, right at the end of the game, after the yeah. events in the main universe at the Temple of the Ancients, um, Cloud and Aerith wake up. 
in like the comatose bodies of them in another universe. And this is their status in the Zack universe. But again, you go on a little date with Aerith and it, on that date, you get to pick a snack at one of these shops. And one of the snacks you can pick is stamp branded potato chips again. And again, it's a different stamp. It's like a Spitz style, like a Pomeranian Spitz style dog. So that's the Spitz universe, I guess. And that universe is doomed, right? That meteors come in or something. Well, and... they're all all of those universes all have the scar in the sky, which is supposed to signify a universe that is buggered, where right. it's over. Sephiroth calls it a, a world that's accepted its fate. Like in all those universes, all the ones that Zach's in as well, everyone is like talking about we're going to get married because, you know, we might as well get married before the world ends or whatever. You know, um, all the NPC dialogues, people saying like, I'm really sad, I won't get to see you grow up or whatever, or you grow old or whatever, things like that. So all those universes are, are, are buggered. Um, and there's a complicated thing that happens here where like the area from Spitch that is in Spitch universe, whether that is the area from that universe, whether that's our area or another area embodying them gives her copy of the holy material to cloud. And then she literally opens a portal and which is key. She opens a portal and she pushes him through the portal and sends him back to Beagle. What's the purpose of this in the story? Well, for whatever reason, earlier on in the game, they they establish that our area of holy materia is broken, and holy is the only thing that stops the world from being destroyed in Final Fantasy VII. And by doing this weird bit of universe hopping, our area gets a copy back that is not broken. And weirdly, now that means there's two because she swaps with Cloud, so she gives Cloud back the broken one. Um. So that would probably have some significance, I guess, in the future. But yeah, so basically, there's all these universes. And it's supposed to demonstrate, I guess, having those three Zack scenes back to back, I guess is supposed to realise that once fate is broken, even a small decision can spin everything off into its own thing. So yeah. just Zack's decision of whether he turns left or turns right creates a new branch. Um, which is weird, because it means like there's now four, five Zacks. <laughs> that we've seen, but who knows how many are alive. But it's clear to me, I think, that the one that you get in the final battles and stuff is the one from the Sheba universe who gets sent into the Pushed, into yeah. the void by Sephiroth because what happens is he's trapped in that void and then there's that wash of rainbow light, which is exactly the same light that appears when Aerith opens the portal for Cloud and that's what rescues Zack. So it's clear that and Aerith is looking out for him and saves him from the void and puts him in a place where he can then help Cloud and the party one way or another. And the, the portal stuff, is that represented by the Whispers as well? Because you've got the White Whispers and the Black Whispers, and the Black Whispers are clearly controlled by Sephiroth. Yeah, the it's White interesting. White Ones, maybe Aerith? Maybe. I mean, that that's the thing that's unclear. Like, I've seen some fans speculating maybe the White Materia is what, bequeaths control of the white whispers what's interesting is um the white whispers also seem to be wanting to make Aerith's death happen so but maybe Aerith that is the... the only thing where they are sort of in concert the white and the black yeah because maybe Aerith knows that that's the only way the world will like get saved though if she dies yeah yeah possibly i mean that that's one of those things that that is i think there's there's going to be a lot more to say on that, but I think we can definitely say the rainbow magic is Aerith. Every time she appears in that back segment of the game, there's that rainbow lighting and sort of sparkles. And actually, when Zack gets west, gets uh, rescued from the void, literally, as well as the rainbow sparkles, there's the petals from the flower that Aerith grows in the church. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we also, in most of those sequences, also see the white whispers, so I think it's fair to to assume that they're Aerith related. <laughs> yeah, and then there's the whole like underwater battle between those around the weapons, which was a bit confusing as well. Well, weapons are just giant creatures that the planet incubates it's, and creates yeah, it's in order to defend self itself. Self-defense mechanism, isn't yeah, it? Like and, antibodies almost. Yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah, totally. And 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 the black whispers are obviously doing stuff to mess up the planet. So when you get that shot of the whispers sort of accosting and fighting with the weapons, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, um, like I guess that's just the tease of all the weapon stuff is going to be a big part of the third game. 
I Dave's, have Dave's more, mouse open. Yeah, I have more questions about the white feather. White feather? Yeah, like right at the beginning of the game when we see Zack and Cloud, we've got the white feather uh, breeze on by. And of course, every time we see a black feather, it's uh, it's the presence of Sephiroth. That's a very good point. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. But the white I mean, feather shows up. Uh, is Aerith going to get Aerith white wings in the next over. game? They're going to go all the fucking way? They don't give a shit? <laughs> that would that that wouldn't you know that that's the sort of imagery Aerith with one white wing the opposite one to what yeah Sephiroth I wouldn't had. be surprised if Aerith turns back up like the, from another dimension like she's because I mean she's Sephiroth not done, finds clearly. her he says this is where you've been hiding doesn't he yeah so he's like he's suggesting that this well, one that we're talking to there is the real one I think the thing that Sephiroth was trying to so we're getting into the moment right but I, I, my read of that is i think the thing that sephiroth was trying to accomplish was to kill every Aerith in every world all at once is what i think he was trying to do so that's why when you're in the spit universe and Aerith literally pushes cloud through the portal right as sephiroth is coming through the doors of the church behind her mm-hmm. and she you know she seems a bit teary-eyed and a bit sad presumably because she knows she's going to die so she gives over. She says, this isn't about me. It's about saving the world. And it's about saving you to Cloud. And she gives him her white materia and pushes him through the portal. And Sephiroth comes in behind her. And you have to assume he just kills her. And Sephiroth sort of seems annoyed <laughs> when the, the sort of a final battle that takes place, it feels like in the spirit plane where it's Aerith and Cloud versus Sephiroth. And as that battle starts, there's a few lines of dialogue. The first thing is, Sephiroth says, I have to admit, I underestimated you. And he's talking to Aerith, he's not talking to Cloud. And I think it's pretty clear from that, that what has happened is, they've maybe created one instance where he didn't manage to do what he was trying to do. So I think, basically, it's probably going to be framed as, in all the worlds, there is now very Avengers endgame actually. In all the worlds, there is now only one world in which she is alive. And that last living Aerith is obviously going to have a key role. And I point out this, from a gameplay perspective, in the original Final Fantasy VII, Aerith gets her ultimate weapon and her ultimate limit break, Great Gospel, uh, very early on, obviously because of, uh, of what happens. She doesn't get her ultimate weapon in this game and she doesn't get Great Gospel in this game. And Great Gospel is an iconic move, you know, much in the same way as Omni Slash is. In fact, yeah. of all the Final Fantasy VII like limit breaks, apart from Cloud's Omni Slash, I would say Great Gospel is the second most important because it's the only one that gets cast again in Advent Children. Like that's the thing that cures the geostigma and heals the world at the end of Advent Children is she casts Great Gospel from beyond the grave. So the fact that she that weapon and that move isn't in the game. Clearly, that weapon and that move are going to be in the next game. Um, so that's a more mechanical nuts and bolts uh, thing because they, they, they've they held back everyone else's ultimate weapons. But but yeah, so I think it's inevitable that she's going to that she's going to have a bigger role to play. But my read, yeah, is that they've managed to create one scenario where she lives. And actually, at the very start of that Sephiroth fight, everyone focuses on the dialogue everyone focuses on the dialogue in the cutscenes, but at the very start of that last Sephiroth fight, there's a line of dialogue where Aerith says to Cloud, I saw what you did there. I saw what you did back there. Thank you. And she can only be talking about him saving her life. Like, Mm. it's almost like this is a version of her that did die saying to him, I saw how you saved that other version of me. Thank you. Which is exactly how that scene sort of plays out. There's a version of her that dies and there's a version of her that doesn't. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and it kind of plays them simultaneously to confuse you, doesn't it? Yeah, it's flickering it's flickering back and forth, but it's sort of like I I think the most obvious thing, people have been confused by those flickers and there's like a shot of Tiffa reacting and people feel like that is an in, is indicative that she can also see the flickers. I don't think any of that is correct. But actually the thing I would encourage people to look at, again, the screenshots of this in the RPG site article, but Whenever you, after, after all the final battles, obviously you've got sort of the quiet moments with Aerith's body. And whenever you see that scene from a more general perspective, two key things. One, there's no whispers. 
No, no whispers to be seen anywhere. Two, Eref is lying on her side, shoulder down. I think her right shoulder down, and Tifa and that are leaning over, are crying. Whenever you see that scene from Cloud perspective, Cloud's perspective, so there's actually one or two shots where you see it from his perspective, first person, and there's some shots where you see it sort of over, over his shoulder. Aerith is lying flat on the ground, which is how he lay, lays her down before the final fight. He lays her flat, and there's whispers circling her body. So I take, and obviously it's the Aerith that's lying flat that Cloud then picks up and says, "I wake up," and she opens her eyes and smiles at him. So I and that's take the that... he sees at the end of the game as well, right? When he starts well, the I mean, black material. That's probably. I mean, what I take that to mean is you literally you're seeing exactly the same scene from two different angles, but there are key things that are different. Her position's different, whether there's whispers there or not is different. Da, 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 da. The way I take it is Cloud is now like straddling universes. Weirdly, he's got one foot in two yeah. different universes, and in one of those universes she is alive, and in one of those universes she's dead. And so he's still with the party, and he can see her, but they can't. And he seems oh. less, well, not at all upset about her death. Yeah, it's like everyone's fo- just going to think he's even more nutty now, though. Aren't well, they? yeah, yeah. Well, you even have. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that. Like at the in the very last CG cutscene, like you sort of see. Barrett and Tifa, Tifa share a, a glance like, what the fuck is going is on with right? this dude? <laughs> yeah. Like, um, but and then Barrett says, okay, we'll trust you. But it's clear that there's big doubts forming, which will be interesting. And yeah, but the fact that he's kept the black material to himself and slotted it as well is a bit like, what the fuck? Does, what are the implications? Well, he does for a while in the original game, but then what? What happens in the original game? If I recall, it's been a while since I played it. But I think you get the choice of if you want to give the black materia to Red or Barrett to keep it safe because Cloud realises he can't be trusted with it. Yeah. And then there's some Genova multiple body trickery where Genova obviously can pretend to be people that tricks whoever you give it to into giving it back to Cloud and then Cloud gives it back to gives it to Sephiroth. <laughs> so we'll see if they keep that beat. Um I wonder if it might be by force this time. I wonder if Barrett might take it from Cloud, given the sort of... Mm. But, I mean, anyway, in that final cutscene, Aerith is there and, like, she's she's not just there hanging out. She's reacting to the others. Like, so when they when they say the, the, the tiny Bronco is fixed, which they also don't do in the original, that never becomes a plane again. No. But, um, she's, like, punching the air, excited. And also there's a moment when she strokes Red's fur and he goes, Aerith? Like he can censor, which obviously remake already established. He and Aerith were the two who were a bit more sensitive to the whispers and the multiverse stuff. So he can clearly sense something, but he's not like Cloud who can see her and speak to her. And obviously Cloud can see the scar in the sky as well, and no one else can. So then you sort of have that element of, so one Cloud's got one foot in this other world, and this other world is doomed. Those are the two things we can mm. take from that, right? Um. What did you make of all the the Gi stuff? Because that seems like it's going to have big implications. Because there's I don't them know murals if it will. of fighting the the Genova in the past and stuff as well. I, I, I don't know if it will. The interesting thing, the, the most interesting thing in that is the implication that the Gi are also aliens from another world. Yeah, because they say the reason they can't return to the planet is because they didn't originate from it. Much the same as Genova, and that's why Sephiroth stops. That's why Sephiroth can still be an influence in the live stream as well, because the idea is even after he's killed, he can't fully return to the planet because the cells that were injected to him, the Genova cells, mean he can't. But because he's sort of half and half, he's half from Gaia, this world, and half not. He sort of just lingers in the live stream like a malevolent nasty like the cold that i've got that i can't currently shift um so that bit's interesting but actually i think the actual oh we're going to explain the origin of the black materia that felt a bit star wars prequely to me not all yeah things it did feel explained. a bit like it didn't need to be there to be honest and and i think some of that gi stuff took away from red's moment as well personally it, it felt like, to me like they felt like that chapter was too short and they wanted to find something else it that scene in the original game like really got me, but in this game, it, you know, where he's, he sees his dad and the tear rolls down his dad's statue at that, it didn't, it didn't have the same impact on me. I don't know why. 
I think it's one of those scenes that there's quite a few of these in Final Fantasy VII. Some of them are better, but it's one of those scenes that is almost better in your head in terms yeah. of the voice, the, the character voice. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think any performance could live up to how that scene lives in your brain. Yeah. Um, Since we're on the subject, I just want to say that the uh, yeah, I agree with Kirk. I didn't the the Red Thirteen scene didn't really really hit for me. I was just like, eh. Uh, but you know what? Uh, controlling child Aerith did hit for me. Yes, that whole sequence was pretty mm. was was pretty cool. Like, uh, yeah, that that whole sequence. Um, the Aerith bit is particularly effective. The Aerith and the Tifa bits are particularly effective. I think the Tifa bits fair play. How do you take a sequence that you've already seen mm-hmm. twice over the previous two games, do it from a slightly different perspective, and still, in fact, three times because you see it in Tifa's live stream jaunt as well in this game yeah um and they still make it effective the the barrett one annoyed me a little bit um just because i feel like they've they've, they've missed the trick on that whole barrett storyline uh, but just to gripe about something in the original game whenever they show coral in flashback it's a lovely little town it sort of looks a bit like it doesn't have the 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 castle walls, but it's got that same classic JRPG town vibe that like calm has and that Gungaga has and stuff like that. And then when they show Coral in flashback in this, it's just like a, it's just a shit shanty town. The same as the same as it is after it was wrecked. And I'm like, well, so what did Shinra actually, okay. Lots of people died, but the town was (laughs) shite before. Um, And so that slightly annoyed me. Like I feel like that. I realised probably they didn't want to build the assets to 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 have one tiny little scene of of uh, of, of Barrett's wife dying, yeah. but it just it, it didn't work as much for me, even though it was new because we've never seen Barrett's wife before. Um, just just to rewind you, but you you spoke before about the mechanical nuts and bolts and how um, Aerith doesn't have her ultimate and stuff and what that could mean for the next game, and. I thought it was interesting that they introduced Zack at the end of the game as like a playable combat character because his whole moveset is totally different and like it, you don't really have time to wrap your head around it properly. So that for me suggests he's going to be a, a major player in the next game. Uh, my like Squall Laguna style switching between them. Maybe. M- probably. I mean, my inside baseball feeling, no one said anything, but people, no one said anything specific, but people say things that give you a vibe. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, who were close to the game's production. And my feeling is probably that as soon as Remake wrapped, wrapped, they started thinking about Rebirth. And one of the first things they started thinking about was Zack. And then Remake came out and they were perhaps a little bit unnerved by some of the response to, to the ending of Remake. And they decided to dial back how much they were going to diverge. And so if right. I'm honest, my feeling, my prediction... Not that we'll probably ever know, but my prediction, or maybe they'll say in interviews for part three, but my prediction is that probably they were going to do more with Zack in this game and they bottled it a little bit mm, right. <laughs> um, and decided to, to, to play it a bit. But I do think it's it's actually quite bad game design in a sense. Like you 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 get Zack for that battle, you've got no chance to look at his equipment, no chance to understand his charge mechanic, you really shouldn't be having a pop up in the last fight that explains no. the base mechanics of how a character works. But I was I just do. figured out how to do his charge thing like at the end of the fight basically because you you got no time to think. I hit level fight. two once. I hit charge level two yeah, once. It's, uh, I got to charge level three once. But oh yeah, my god! And obviously at the end of the game, Zach wakes up in back in the. So I mean, what happens to Zach? First of all, he ends up on Final Destination with Cloud for that fight against Sephiroth, and they fight um, fine. Then Sephiroth literally says something like, worlds can come together, but worlds can be parted again. And he slices his sword, and they end up separated again. Zack ends up, I think, in the void again, and then again Aerith rescues him, and he gets dropped into like a classic JRPG end of game. So it's like he's in the church, but everything around it has ended. Now this could just be, you know, imagery, but the way I take that is that that is the world that he was in before that was ending. And that is the very end of that world where literally everything else is gone except for the last little surviving piece of that world is that tiny outcropping 
of the Sector 5 church, presumably which is only able to hold on because of Arius influence. Mm. So he fly, he helps to fight Sephiroth there. What's key there is that, and again, this supports the fact that the Sephiroth, Sephiroth's across all universes are all linked, is that they're all fighting the same thing, but the actions of one affects the other. So it's like Cloud and Zack aren't in the same place, aren't even in the same universe, it appears, but they can trigger a synergy attack together. And when you do that, a ghostly version of the other one appears and helps. And, and it looks cool as hell. It does look cool. And then when Cloud and Zack together, sl- together but apart, slice off one of Sephiroth Reborn, which in the first in the original game was called Bizarro Sephiroth, when they slice off his horn, that horn flies off for Barrett and everyone back in the Beagle universe. And they even comment, like, it feels like someone's helping us. So, like, that instance of Sephiroth is being fought across multiple universes, which sort of speaks to that ability to straddle and be in multiple places at once, right? Yeah. Um, but then at the end of that, it looks like Zach, Zach's ready, right, for the world to end. And he just stands and looks at the fireball that's coming towards him. And then there's a gust of wind and more of that magical rainbow magic. And Zach falls for a portal in the flower bed that Aerith used to grow. And the next time we see him, he's awake and he's in the Sector 5 church again and everything's okay. Now, probably, I think the single biggest question in the ending, because I think the Aerith stuff's pretty clear cut, in my opinion, but the single biggest question is, where is that that Zack wakes up? Is that Beagle. another u- Is that Beagle. another new universe? Is this going to be Cocker Spaniel universe or Sheepdog <laughs> universe? Or is he in Beagle at last in the same universe as everyone else? And is the game going to be almost him finding out what's happened, catching up, going on a lovely tour of all the environments from Remake and Rebirth that they can reuse, um, and eventually catching up with everyone in the la- in the back half of the game? How do you think they're going to handle the Cloud Zack reveal? Because they didn't really do that in this did they well so there's a few things i'd say to this I mean, this is where your lack of knowledge of the original brains comes to hurt you a little bit well obviously they have that sequence where tifa falls into the live stream mm. and that sequence has all the visual hallmarks it's basically the same visually and stylistically as the scene where that happens to cloud in the original game so they've got a tr- and that's obviously where cloud comes comes to peace yeah. So the thing is, they've done that scene now. Mm-hmm. They I have... feel, but that's the thing. If they've got Zach in the same universe, they can do it through Zach, right? Well, that's what I mean. But that, that, so I wonder, did they do that scene with Tifa because they wanted to make sure that people who wanted to hear that music, who am I, and th- see those yeah. visuals, had seen it. So they found a new way to do it with, with Tifa instead of Cloud. So I wonder. I mean, that that's hard to... It's, it's hard to say, but it, it feels like... Well, it, that can only go one of two ways, which is either Zack is going to be directly involved in that or Zack will not enter the story, at least from their perspective, until after Cloud has already come to his senses. It is quite cool, like, in that flashback sequence, just knowing that Cloud's one of them soldiers stood there. You can pan the camera around and look at his face and see this. Well, did you well. notice the voice acting stuff? No. So I, I just think that's it's one of those things. It's a small detail, and of course they did this, but, like, so... In the flashback, the the random soldier is voiced by Zach's voice actor. Oh, really? Because That's they've cool. literally swapped swapped roles. And then I think when you do see it a couple of times from Tifa's perspective, it's swapped again. Um, oh, that's so it's cool. sort of it's it's kind of cute that they they got Zach's VO to go in and record all those lines from the Shinra soldier. Um, yeah, yeah, the like the that. the. the that Cloud says well, formally. Um, but it's it's weird because they're sort of holding on to that mystery, except it's not really a mystery anymore. I think it's pretty obvious, um, even if you yeah. haven't played Crisis Core and stuff at this point. I don't know, though. I think if you went into this completely fresh and didn't know, you'd still be pretty... Like, you'd know something was going on. But what's on, weird is this game quite what it is. has absolutely no... makes absolutely no attempt whatsoever to explain... If you come into this game and you play this game and you've never played um, the original game or Crisis Core, and you've only played Remake, this game makes absolutely no effort whatsoever to explain who Zack is. No, you come out, in, no. The, in Remake, you knew nothing. It's just a guy who looks like Cloud and has the same sword. 
You get a hint that he was Aerith's boyfriend, right? And that's and, and in this game, yeah, you learn that he was Aerith's ex-boyfriend and you also learn that Tifa also somehow knows him. Mm-hmm. They stop short of having Tifa and Aerith say he was at Nibelheim. They sort of, uh, they cut away. There's that scene when they're in the bedroom uh, in calm, talking, having a girl, having a, having a girl's chat without Cloud present. And it's clear that's what they're about to talk about. And then they also stop. on on that quickly in the gold saucer dates, there's like four opportunities and in, in both versions of the uh, Aerith and Tifa dates where Cloud asks if they managed to speak to each other about that. And they both lie to him, which suggests they still don't quite trust him. Well, I think they're just worried that he's completely cuckoo. But, <laughs> I mean, he is. So, But yeah, I mean, it's it's it'll be interesting because I think that's going to be one of the hardest things to not mess up. Um, yeah. And I feel like they could have done with a bit more Zach in this game to sort of tee that up. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's... I can't weird. wait to see where they go with it, to be honest. Um, Dave, is there any more questions you want to throw out before we wrap it up? No, that is that is that is the only thing I want to ask now, is uh, what are we expecting for the next game? Uh, and I want to throw out there uh, playable Advent Children. <laughs> we already mentioned that, that Ever Crisis well, is attempting that. So and I kind of think they're going to go all the way. I, I don't do. think they are going to go all the way. They have made a point in interviews of going, "Oh, you're going to see how remake and Advent Children connect and lead into and and it ha- and you've had Kitase saying, "Well, of course, no matter what changes we make, remake will always lead into Advent Children or Advent, you know, and all that sort of stuff." Mm-hmm. I think that's weasel words, and what you're actually going to find when all said and done is that when the Sephiroth revelation of the unknown Sephiroth comes to pass, what you'll realize is, is Advent Children is re- Final Fantasy VII Remake is a sequel to Advent Children from Sephiroth's perspective. And that will be how it connects. But I think the remake narrative will wipe away Advent Children. I think, what do you do if you remake this story? We're talking about final, final end. How does the original Final Fantasy VII end? The world is saved, but like, People's lives are completely destroyed because, like, you know, Midgar's destroyed, Marco's finished. Da, 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 da. It doesn't leave the world in a good state. What you've got in Advent Children is a world that's broken. And there's a thing it in ends Advent with Children. Red, though, it? What's red, that? Red, red 13 running across the planet and it's all green. And well, shit, it, it, so it does because the original the game has a lovely, has a lovely, uh, like, ambiguous ending where you don't know if humanity survived or not. So that's why you only see red because mm. it's like, the idea is, did the planet decide to just kill everyone? Because actually, the easiest thing for the planet would be if humans are all dead because they're all a liability. So I thought that's a great ending. Obviously, they, mm. they ruined that. They, they pissed all over that. So yeah, so in Advent Children, the world is in a pretty dire state. There's this thing called geostigma, which is like a disease that's infecting children and infecting adults as well. And it's basically, that gene- that disease is called caused by Genova cells still swimming around in the live stream. And that's making people really ill. Cloud's miserable because he's racked with guilt um, for what happened. Like, he's living with Tifa, but there's no relationship there, really. She's just sort of almost like his carer because he's so miserable and pathetic. Um, what do you do in this story in terms of endgame? Well, I think you make a slightly happier ending. Slightly. Yeah, but that's... Bollocks, you know. Let me give I, you. I like so the button. <laughs> I, I've had a, I've had a theory since literally the minute that I finished remake, and I apologise, but it's going to involve very briefly talking about Doctor Who. Oh, um, not again. There's a, there's a, there's a Doctor Who episode, really good episode, fabulous episode, um, made me cry the first time I saw it, called Father's Day, and the companion played by Billy Piper, um, she asks the Doctor to take her back to the day her dad died. Because her dad was killed in a hit and run accident and he was on his own when he died because the other guy just drove off and he just died in the middle of his in the middle of the road on his own. By the time the ambulance turned up, he was already dead. And she said, Would it really change anything if I went back and held his hand while he died and then we got out of there before the ambulance came? And the doctor says, No, it wouldn't make any difference because he's dying anyway. So takes her back. And she can't help herself and she saves his life. And she thinks this is great, but then the universe starts falling to pieces because there's a man alive in the world that shouldn't be alive. Um, And lots of things happen in the interim. You know, the doctor gets killed as well. And it's actually the dad who realizes that in this like sort of spooky, actually a little bit reminiscent of Zach, 
where he keeps encountering platoons of Shinra soldiers. Uh, the car that was supposed to hit the dad, he keeps seeing it everywhere he goes. And he eventually puzzles it out. And he realizes that the only way to set things right is for him to die. And so he goes and throws himself in front of that car. And it kills him. But she then goes and holds his hand as he dies. And then and then leaves before the ambulance comes and stuff and gets to be with him in his dying moments. And the episode's bookended by two different scenes. And it's the same scene twice of the mom telling Rose, the companion, about her dad's death. But the first one is, is sad and horrible because he died on his own and it was hit and run. And the second one is ever so slightly better because the driver stops and this mysterious girl holds his hand as he passes away. And so that's the tiny way in which those actions changed the future. Anyway, as soon as I saw Remake and I saw Zack survived, I was like, this is going to be this. This is going to be... And, and to be fair, Jim Trinker would be annoyed if I didn't know this. Star Trek's done a few versions of that as well. There's Yesterday's Enterprise and stuff, which are very similar on the tropes of history is supposed to happen a certain way, and that means people need to sacrifice themselves, whatever. Um... But I think Father's Day is a better example, and it's a good forty. You know, if you can find that that on Disney Plus or whatever, and 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 it's not Plus. on Disney Plus, is it? Plus. Plus. But if you can find it, it's a good forty-five minutes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, when I saw Zach was alive, I was like, "That's what's going to happen." Like Zach is going to live, and Arif's going to live, and then at the end, they're both going to have to die. But it'll be more on their terms rather than getting horrendously ripped away. And so I think, what do you do? Grand scheme. You create a world where the end of Final Fantasy VII is humanity survival is a bit more upbeat, and they're not just living in the gutter and having to rebuild everything. Perhaps there's some of something of a middle ground. You know, Mako energy still has to go, but maybe Midgard doesn't need to get flattened. And second, you create more on a personal level. You create a character ending where Cloud is not racked by guilt. He knows Aerith has gone off into the live stream with Zack or maybe gone off to another world with Zack and gets to be with Zack. And it allows him to be with Tifa, which will make all the shipping people who love Cloud and Aerith together really mad. But I've got to be honest, this game sort of makes pretty pretty clear that yeah, Cloud and Tifa is the thing. <laughs> Even on the Gold Saucer date, like Aerith literally drags him to the gondola, doesn't she? Whereas... He walks willingly with Tifa, and then they share a kiss. Whereas, it's well, don't forget, in the original game, they shag anyway at the end of the game. Clan Tifa, like it, mm. it's you know, regardless of how close you are, who if you get Aerith as the gold saucer date in the original game, Cloud and Tifa have it before the final battle. <laughs> they decide we're gonna we're gonna do it because um, we're gonna die tomorrow anyway. Um, so that's what I would do. I think the interesting thing from a pure character perspective. Um, I think the interesting thing beyond that is they've left themselves surprisingly little of the original game left to do. Mm -hmm. And actually several of the iconic moments because of the story changes they've made either don't work or will have to be refought significantly to work. Like Rocket Town. Well, Rocket Town, yeah, I mean, like, why do you go to Rocket Town the second time, which they've cut the first time and I don't think they'll put that back in. You go there to get the huge material which was used to power the rocket. But in this game, they sort of established that Shinra doesn't have a history with the huge material, which is why Scarlet's so desperate to get their hands on it. So they wouldn't have used that to power the rocket. Um, because if they had one just chilling in the rocket, or if they had one just chilling in the underground reactor at, at, uh, at Junan, Scarlet would have just got it from there. She wouldn't be going and going to Gungaga and getting in a fight with a weapon. So all that stuff, all the parameters of all that stuff has to change. Yeah. Well, I'm interested um, to see how they go, but I think we can all agree on one thing is Sid needs to swear a lot more in the next game. I don't mind the swearing because there's enough swearing in this game. Yeah, but Sid's a foul-mouthed little bastard. so. But uh, it's the smoking that I miss. Yeah. Um, I just feel like he doesn't seem right not smoking. I feel like he, I mean, I know he was always in his 30s anyway, but he feels a bit too young, actually, mm. in this game. Bit cheeky, isn't he? Or is that it's not really? Yeah, but, like but all the say, other character characterizations are spot on. I just don't. He doesn't seem right. To he's me. better executed than Vincent, not character wise, but just in the sense of were you not really like annoyed by the way Vincent just turns turn. up in cutscenes and stuff. Well, it's really weird that they make a big deal about him holding the portal open for Cloud at the end of the game, 
but then he's not there for the final battle, even though people literally walk straight from the portal straight to the final battle. Like, what did he do? Go, you guys carry on. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna chill out here. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like <laughs> it, it's such a weird implementation, especially after Red was just on the sidelines. I don't think it would have been that big an ask to just have Red, just have Red, just have Vincent in that final battle, just off to the side, firing a bit few shots out of his shotgun or whatever. But weird. Uh. Well, we'll see in the next game anyway. We will. But that's a very convoluted explanation. I mean, it is it's a very convoluted story, <laughs> to be fair. Maybe next time I come on, I can come on and talk about something that actually makes sense. <laughs> Kingdom Hearts? No. I am not a Kingdom Hearts person. Again, Kingdom Hearts fans don't interact. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I respect I respect Kingdom Hearts a great deal. But for me, it lost me a little bit. Um well, we appreciate you coming on anyway, Alex. Yeah, it was thank nice you, to Alex. chat to you and yeah. pick your brain about all this stuff that's rattling around in there. <laughs> well, thank you to people for listening. Thank you for having me and thank you to people for, he, he for listening to, to this complicated slop. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's good complicated slop, though, isn't it? I'm personally happy that Don Carneo's uh, bodyguard doorman came back. Fucking yeah. Leslie. Hell yeah, Leslie. What about... Hold on, before we wrap up. I, oh, no. I'm not going to go off on a tangent. I am a little bit, but the okay. bald bar. Now that's representation. I know, right? This I'm is looking this forward to the soundtrack for. because they've got the song in the bald bar. And I, oh, the I, I shine, like shine my your, head thing. Yeah, yeah I feel I, like that could be your theme tune for this podcast. I can't believe that <laughs> the soundtrack is what they've got. A, like a soundtrack for the one mission with a dog. And then they got bow, a combat bow, version bow, bow, bow. of it as well. Like, what the fuck? It's very, it, it's, it's definitely a stark contrast to. Not just the soundtrack, but just in general. This and Final Fantasy sixteen, 16. are like two sides of, yeah. the, of the same coin. For better and for worse. In both in both cases. Yeah. I was oh, listening I... to Bow Wow Wow yesterday. Absolute <laughs> I banger. listened to it this morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolute banger. I'm not sure about the old oh, stamp we love you so from the children, like fuck off. All right then. See you later, team. Thanks for chatting. Bye bye. <laughs> See ya. Cheers, guys.